Um, so without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce um, Dr. Ed Park, who is going to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Edward J.W. Park, which I never knew before, and I want to know what that J.W. is, um, is a professor and chair of Department of Asian and Asian American Studies at Loyola Marymount University. He received his PhD in Ethnic Studies with a dis disciplinary concentration in sociology from the University of California, Berkeley. His publications include Probar Probationary Americans, Contemporary Immigration Policies, and the Shaping of Asian American Communities, and Asian Americans, an Encyclopedia of Social, Cultural, and Political History. And more impressive than all that is the fact that this is his 23rd year in LMU. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rhonda. Uh, and thank you to all the folks here at the library who organized uh, this event and extended a, the invitation and gave me the honor of introducing uh, Dr. Nadia Kim. Uh, last night I was on campus uh, for the Moon uh, Festival uh, celebration, and that was a packed house. And this is a packed house, and I just think it's just incredibly uh, a nice. Uh, for all the folks to return and have these events. And I hope that you know this energy and this vibrancy continues um, into the future. So it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Nadia Kim. Uh, Dr. Nadia Kim is professor in the Department of Asian and Asian American Studies and has been at LMU since 2007. She is a prolific scholar working in the intersections of comparative uh, and global race, ethnic, and gender studies, environmental justice and social movements, and the politics of immigrants and immigration. She is the author of two award-winning books published by Stanford University Press, the first, Imperial Citizens, Koreans and Race from Seoul to Los Angeles, published in 2008, and Refusing Death, Immigrant Women and the Fight for Environmental Justice in Los Angeles, which was published just last year. She is a sought after speaker on these topics and her work has been featured in National Public Radio, The Washington Post, and, New and uh, Korea Times. So please help me welcome Professor Nadia Kim. Thank you so much for being here. I am honored and humbled to be here during rush hour in LA. Wow, that is not something I take for granted. Um, I am going to be wearing a mask. I hope that's okay with you. Uh, I just, with all the craziness of COVID and now monkeypox or whatever is going on, I just, you know, I just feel safer. So thanks for understanding. If you can't hear me, please let me know and I will do my best to project, okay? So let me just make sure I. Yeah, um, how do I maximize what I minimize? Thank you, John, sorry. So I should say thank you to John Jackson, Rhonda Rosen, who I work with most directly for this talk, but obviously Chris, Ron, I'm sure I'm missing people, but just know that I thank you so much for organizing this. I know this is a lot of work. I have to say I'm so impressed with the library and the work you do with Faculty Pub Night. It's incredible, um, and so I'm very appreciative. Okay. So um, I'm just going to get right into it. Um, with regard to why is this topic important, I think you guys know environmental justice is related to climate justice, which is the reason why the world is melting right now and none of us can handle the heat, right? <laughs> to become humid in LA, what is that all about? Um, but also it's connected to COVID-19, for example. So we haven't made the connection enough that um, what is the reason that Black, Latinx, Pacific Islander, Indigenous communities are disproportionately hospitalized and dying of COVID-19? And that's because they are typically living in areas that are right next to hyperpollution. So their health is already compromised, making it difficult for them to withstand COVID-19 and its symptoms, okay? The other um, so what uh, answer I wanna give is that if we care about understanding racism and class injustice, there's no way of understanding either without centering environmental racism and environmental classism, okay? So um, I have a general research question that guides my talk today, and 
I just want to say that um, my book is on the longish side. Some of you may know this. Students are lamenting this fact, but so I'm only going to be able to really address a slice. Um, so in the q and I'm more than happy to, to elaborate, okay? But the question that guides my talk today is when it comes to issues of environmental justice and the intersecting dynamics within, and by that I mean how race, class, gender intersect, right? What role do emotions play? I think emotions are a dimension of society that we don't address enough, especially in the social sciences, but I found it to be absolutely crucial, okay? And, how it played out for both the top-down elites, which were mostly corporate and government uh, regulatory officials and institutions, um, as well as the bottom-up. So they're the activists themselves and the residents, who are predominantly Asian, uh, mostly Filipinx, um, as well as Latinx, mostly Mexican, okay? So um, the data method, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about. Uh, I decided with the library committee that I would speak more about how to do this kind of research, how to do activist research, ethnography interviewing, et cetera, in the Q&A. It's just to let you know when I did this study. I did this study in 2008 to 2010, and then 2011 to 2013. Um, in the middle, I stopped to give birth to my first daughter, who is sitting here right now, too. And I stopped right before I gave birth to my second daughter, who is Kitani, right here, sitting next to me. And the reason I bring that up is because in feminist and intersectional methodologies, we focus on how your positionality affects the kind of research you do or if you're able to do research or not, right? And so in the book, I do talk a lot about how I had to sort of negotiate being a mother, having a newborn, being out in the field, um, and how that affects my research, right, and my ability to do it. And in fact, it directly related to how I interpreted the many immigrant mothers, Asian and Latinx, that I worked with. Okay, so um, my main source of data were three and a half years or almost 300 hours of ethnographic participant observation in the social movements. Um, so this meant that I spent time with them in their environment um, and I worked with them, I supported, I sometimes just shadowed and, and sometimes I was organizing myself alongside. Um, I also conducted almost 50 interviews with the activist leaders, okay, and some of them were not leaders, but they were members or detached allies of five community-based organizations and three supplementary organizations, okay. I'm not going to have time to go into all of it, um, but just to give you just a quick orientation, so Long Beach Alliance for Children with Asthma, Community Partners Council, Coalition for a Safe Environment, okay. People's Core and Communities for a Better Environment. This is probably the most well known, all right? One thing I need to stress that sometimes confuses people about my book is that I studied the two movements separately, mostly because they didn't organize together. And that's because, as many of you know, neighborhoods are residentially segregated, right? And so the neighborhoods where the mostly Mexican immigrant organizations worked were Wilmington and West Long Beach, okay? Um, the other neighborhood was Carson, and maybe you might know Carson from the big IKEA that imposes the freeway <laughs> when you drive down there. Um, that has a very large concentration of Filipinx Americans, okay? And that is more of a suburb. It is sort of a mixed uh, racial and ethnic suburb, more middle class in various ranks of the middle class, okay? The Mexican American communities and the organizations that work therein were mostly unauthorized. Uh, mostly uh, Mexican descent and mostly working class and low income. Okay, so they're different demographics, they're different communities, but they sometimes work together when the leaders of these various organizations would decide to work in coalition because obviously there's issues that are pressing and urgent, right? But it didn't happen that often. Part of the issue is different languages spoken, right? The Mexican, predominantly Mexican movement speaks Spanish, while the other movement, the Filipinx movement, did not, okay? One of the more multiracial organizations, and probably the most renowned, is Communities for a Better Environment. Uh, lots of Latinx, Asian, Pacific Islander, uh, and some Black American, okay? So I think I'm just sharing enough about that. Um, I also did um, hundreds and thousands of pages of analysis of everything from agendas and minutes to presentations. This was the less sexy side of the research, but important nonetheless, okay? So environmental injustice today, um, what are the major sources of pollution? And for these communities, uh, these Latinx and Asian communities, the uh, major sources of hyper pollution, right? 
So I want to just provide a little bit of context, which some of you may have learned already, um, is that, as you know, the U.S. used to be a, a manufacturing economy, right? We became a rich superpower off of making things, right? The industrial era. But in about the 70s and 80s, we decided that we are going to uh, get cheap labor, and we're going to take all those factories that were in L.A. or Philadelphia or Chicago, and we're going to ship them to the global south, or what people may be more familiar with as the third world, okay? And so that means that when you make that shift from a manufacturing to a service economy, we are now still, you know, a very much a service economy and at its apex, that um, we have to ship most everything that you and I buy across the ocean, right? So uh, where is most of our stuff made today? You want to throw it out? China. Is China close? Absolutely not, right? So what... Um, energy source are those container, uh, cargo containers running on when they travel all those thousands of miles, right? Well, it's diesel, okay? So here's a picture right here of the port um, of LA and Long Beach, okay, where all the cargo containers come in with their big cargo containers full of the things that you and I buy from clothes to tchotchkes to cars to electronics, right? And then what happens after that? Well, they have to be loaded onto big trucks, right? And that's why you see a lot of these trucks rumbling up the 710, right, um, from the port. And they go to all the stores that you and I buy from, right? But they don't just go across the state of California, they go across the country. So Target, Sam's Club, Costco, Best Buy, whatever it is, furniture stores, car dealers. They're also uh, placed on trains, okay? So both these trucks and these trains run on diesel. Right? So besides the fact that there's a vortex of diesel that um, the Latinx and Asian uh, immigrant communities I worked with have to contend with, they're also dealing with the presence of freeways that are usually built in and through their neighborhoods, obstructing and, you know, basically uh, running amok in their neighborhoods. They've got to deal with the rail yards in and through their neighborhoods, um, in addition to the port being there. And what do we need to make diesel? Or what do we need to make anything, right? Uh, including this bottle, including this pencil, it is oil, right? We need oil refineries. So um, a lot of the oil refineries are also located right next to these communities that I studied. So as you can see here, this is just uh, you know a soup of toxic chemicals okay, and, and environmental pollutants. Um, I just wanted to give you a picture of the Port of LA in Long Beach just to show you how gar gargantuan it is. Um, it looks like a mini city within Los Angeles, but you see here the cargo containers coming in from far-flung nations. You see the cranes that basically unload a lot of the goods and then the goods movement apparatus I told you about, trucks, trains, um, etc. okay? So just to give you an orientation as well, so this is the on the map, uh, you know, this is kind of a new way to look at LA. Uh, so this is the Port of LA in Long Beach, okay? So this is Wilmington, a predominantly um, a working class, a Latinx uh, community, unauthorized. Um, also, another one similar is West Long Beach, okay? And then Carson's up here, okay? The oil refinery uh, belt is here, okay? So, um, and you can see the freeways that we need for all this goods movement, right? To take all the goods across the state and across the country. So one of the first findings I wanted to share with you, and I share a lot from my interviews and from my field observations with you today, because I think that's the most compelling, is it was interesting to me that you go in with a question, right? And this is one of the ways we understand how to do research, right? I went in with a question that had absolutely nothing to do with what I ended up finding and writing, right? And that's okay, it's called grounded research, grounded theory, it's often used by social scientists. And one of the things that the activists really wanted to talk a lot about um, were their feelings, right? Like how they felt, the impact this was having on their emotional lives, on their physical bodies, um, and, you know, their sensory, you know, um, sort of embodiment, right? And I didn't necessarily expect that. I mean, I knew that that would be a part of it, but I thought they might talk more about, okay, how do you organize, and what do we want, and, and you know, and, and that was a part of it, but here's an example of Lily, who is a youth environmental justice activist with Communities for a Better Environment. She's an undocumented Filipina-American woman, 
And she, it was interesting, this narrative, because she basically was telling me how it felt to embody oil, okay? The oil refineries being so, uh, you know, cramped there. So she said to me, it wasn't until high school, like I started going to people's houses, I started hanging out with people, and like, I would see that where they would live was right next to a refinery. Like all, and she chuckles, my friends live next to a refinery. And I remember like, it was frustrating. Like as a child, I remember when they would flare. Now for those of you who don't know, flaring is when the oil refineries do a massive release of multiple toxic gases into the atmosphere. Refineries often do it illegally, so they'll do it late at night or the wee hours in the morning so residents don't see it or don't complain, but it's incredibly toxic and cancerous, right? So she said, when they flare, I actually believe that that's how you made clouds. And so, you know, I, I, I said, oh, really? And we both chuckled together, right? And she said, I would look at them and tell my mom, oh, look, there's my cloud, right? And I think this is a really fascinating narrative because she's talking about how her and her friends in the community felt like they embodied oil refineries because they were everywhere. They're omnipresent. They're basically the neighbors you bump into, right? But she also says, you know, I was very frustrated. So as a youth, she's not just thinking about all the regular things that high school kids have to think about, but about how emotionally taxing it was to live amongst these oil refinery mini cities, okay? And then she is basically telling us that oil refineries are so omnipresent that they become part of na nature, like they become naturalized as a part of nature such that they're the reason we have cumulus clouds in the sky, right? Not precipitation, but oil refineries, right? And I think there's something very instructive about that. The other major factor I wanted to share with you from my findings was the way in which institutions, dominant groups, use emotions as a way to establish, maintain, and expand their power. I don't think this is something that we have developed enough, even though in sociology and related disciplines, we have made major strides in the study of emotions and it has been incredibly influential, um, even in our public dis discourse and mainstream life, right? So a lot of you probably heard the term emotional labor, right? When people and workers and women, and women of color have to perform emotional labor. Well, that came from sociology, okay, Arlie Hochschild, and other gender uh, feminist scholars, you know, started these um, landmark studies of how women, in particular, in uh, occupations that were deemed, you know, lower service sector, right, pink collar, so secretaries, nurses, uh, teachers, flight attendants, right. Um, that they have to perform emotional labor and you know follow these kinds of feeling rules and norms, and if they don't, they often get punished, right? In, in some way, shape, or form. You know, this is something now that's old hat, right? Emotional labor. Another uh, finding within sociology of emotions that has become popular is the way in which racism and white supremacy cause a great deal of depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation among people of color, okay? So this has become more commonplace, and all of these studies are incredibly important. But if you notice, those studies really focus on the bottom up. They focus on the people who are most uh, marginalized or disadvantaged by um, you know, these feelings that they have to deal with in relation to oppression, right? But what I also want to focus on is how do dominant institutions and groups actually use, deploy emotions, emotional strategies, emotional structures to actually have power and maintain power? So one of the ways that I found it was in a common occurrence of apathy, right? So the apathy was mostly white American male officials, corporate and government against these mostly Mexican and Filipina immigrant women, mostly, right? And so obviously there's an intersection there of race and gender or race, gender, class, race, gender, class, citizenship status. We could look at all the intersections, right? But here, uh, Ben, who was the leader of the environmental justice struggle for People's Corn Carson, and he's a youth activist himself, he really stressed the sexist part of that apathy, okay? So he, think, he said, I think for the most part, they don't really listen to the Filipino women. I think especially if they're not speaking their language of business or just like their capitalist language. I think maybe women have a stronger tendency, tendency to speak more about, you know, business affecting my family, my community, 
Okay. And so because that wasn't what the regulatory officials from the state or what BP ARCO, for example, cared about, you know, they were very dismissive when the immigrant women and the mothers would speak and focus on how this affects my family and how this affects my community. There's a lot of apathy, right? Another strategy that I saw uh, very commonly and quite normalized was guilting, okay? There's lots of incidences of this, but um, it was often guilting by way of condescension. And so this is just one example, okay? So just to bring you to the field work moment, we're sitting there in a meeting where the um, predominantly Asian and Latinx immigrant activists uh, many from our women and mothers are there to protest the widening of the 710 freeway, mm -hmm. which, by the way, hasn't happened in large part because of pressure from these communities. Um, it's kind of like on hold right now. But as you know, they just want more goods movement, more goods movement, right? And during the supply chain logjam, I'm sure you know they were really thinking about like how do we get goods moved faster and more right. more goods, right, into the shelves, and. Um, you know, these women and these residents were obviously opposed to it. And so they started talking about the fact that, you know, uh, Marta Cota, for example, and, and this, that's her real name, she's a longtime activist. She said to the community advisory committee, which is a state committee, she said, look, I have cancer, okay? I have cancer because of all this hyperpollution. I am undocumented, I don't have access to healthcare, okay? Um, you know, this is a problem that isn't just about uh, us not feeling well, right? Uh, this, you know, extends into healthcare, extends into being able to exercise outside and be healthy, the list goes on and on. And um, what the, this was a white male presenting representative. I mean, you know, I don't know for sure, but you know, the point is he could pass. And he replied, instead of with sympathy, empathy, you know, I hope you're okay. I'm sorry to hear that. He said, you know, I had cancer for many years and it was very difficult for me and my family too. You guys are not the only ones who get cancer, air pollution. And he said that with feeling, okay? Very negative feeling, okay? <laughs> and all of us kind of gasped collectively and were slack-jawed because we, we couldn't believe that basically he was saying that your cancers aren't important enough, right? I'm decentering your agency and I'm inserting myself because my experience my agency, my cancer is more important, okay? So taking a systemic community-wide problem and individualizing it about him, okay? Which is often done um, by those who haven't examined their own privilege, right? Another strategy that was used by state and corporate was disbelief, annoyance, and mockery. This is very, very common. So here's a very quick and easy example that came from Teresa. She's an undocumented Mexican immigrant woman activist. And she said, our Pueblo is speaking for what it needs. A lot of the time, the people who are supposed to be listening, helping the community, they listen and they just laugh, okay? This I witnessed many, many times over. It was also uh, expressed by many of the activists many times over. And a lot of times it was kind of laughing, like shaking the head, uh, getting on the phone and walking out. Um, not listening anymore when the Spanish is being spoken, um, and so this was a kind of you know annoyance, mockery. I don't, I'm, I don't believe this, right? You're exaggerating, okay? And this is an actual picture of some of the immigrant women I worked with uh, against the rail yards and expanding the rail yards in their communities, um, and it's just a generic picture I, I got. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the bottom-up ways in which the immigrant activists harness uh, their own emotional resistance, right? The politics of emotion in this environmental justice fight. So um, to give you the context for this particular moment, uh, it was a sort of perfunctory uh, meeting where BP Arco, the oil refinery, presents to the public, to the community, and basically wants to get their permit renewed, okay, to operate, right? And, and you know, these are very sort of like unceremonious, like, you know, rubber stamped, whatever. Um, but the community still goes out because they want to make known uh, their experience and their, uh, basically here they want it to be known that there's an emotional toll that they suffer, okay, from hyperpollution. Well, what I love about this moment is that you see a lot of other dimensions um, that I just described play out in this one 
uh, moment in time. Okay, <laughs> so there was a, a Japanese American widow who walked up um, at this public comment. She talked about how her husband had worked at a Torrance oil refinery all his life and that he had died soon after working his entire life at this oil refinery. And she said to the BPR co and state officials, she said, I'm not blaming you for his death, but it seems like more than just a coincidence, right? <laughs> and the state, especially the BPR co officials replied, not with, I'm really sorry, or, you know, uh, we empathize with your laws or anything like that, but they launched right into, well, we're meeting our regulations and our guidelines and we're still within the allowable limits of, uh, you know, uh, pollution. We're in the allowable limits of cancer. I mean, this is literally what goes on. There are allowable limits of uh, causing people cancer and causing people premature death. Okay, that's the way regulation works um, in a neoliberal economy, which I'll get into later. But so um, what uh, Cindy, who is a Samoan American, so she's a Pacific Islander teacher in Carson, K-12, of People's Corps, what she did is she wanted to respond to the official's deficit of empathy, right? And all of their sort of cold, hard, rational, technological statistics. And she started yelling, like I jumped out of my seat, you know, I was probably daydreaming a little bit. And she said, I am so angry, I am so tired of being sick, of seeing sick children at my elementary where I work. She lists, we have constant bloody noses, constant headaches, we constantly faint, uh, I have fibromyalgia. She said, you know, it's very possible that her husband's cancer was caused by all this pollution. And then she turns to the Japanese American widow and says, I'm really sorry for your loss, okay? So the apathy is clear from the top down. But interestingly, what she's also doing is in this last statement, she's providing that emotional support that she felt should have been given the widow, but was not. And so this is a form of politics, right? She's also talking about the toll. I'm so angry, I'm so tired of being sick, right? And lists the illnesses of the students and many of the teachers around her. And this is also a strategy, right? Because what she's doing, and it's what many of the activists did, is they perform this as a way to expose the government and corporate officials as cold-hearted, right? As unfeeling, uncaring. Even though, you know, on their Exxon oil commercial, they put them wiping a poor pelican's wings <laughs> off with oil. They care so much, right? Oil and gas care so much about the environment that they're continuing to pollute and cause climate change, right? But, you know, that's the point. Like, they're sort of destabilizing the whole politics of care that the oil industry, the regulatory agency have co-opted, right, from these communities, these immigrant mothers themselves, okay? She's also doing it, just quickly to let you know, to convince the activists or the residents in the audience, uh, mostly residents, who are afraid to get involved because they're afraid, uh, because they're undocumented, right, of being uh, detained, deported, surveilled. Um, there are a lot of activists, uh, residents in the community who just don't feel comfortable getting involved. They fear reprisals and or they're hopeless. Like, what's the point? They're gonna pollute anyway, they, they don't care, right? So there's all these different factors that these emotional strategies sort of engage with, okay? The other factor I wanna talk about is, since citizenship is such an important um, element for immigrants, how do these immigrant activists start seeing citizenship as they become more politically involved or more involved in environmental justice? And I think what's so important to say is that citizenship is not just about the undocumented getting papers and becoming legal, right? Citizenship is not just about being able to vote and being able to run for office um, and being part of the electoral realm, big P politics, right, as they kind of described it. But citizenship to them was being good moral supports to one another. So when I say embodied and emotional here, I'm saying that they feel like what a good moral citizen does is they take care of the bodies and the emotions that are assaulted by this system, right? Um, and neglected by this system. 
And so there are lots of examples of how they talked about this form of citizenship that they prioritized and practiced. And it came especially through their unwillingness to move, all right? And a lot of times these, uh, these officials would say, why don't you just move, right? Just move, right? So obviously that's a question of love with privilege, but. So I asked, what do you say when they say, why don't you just move somewhere cleaner? And Cindy, she's the Samoan we uh, met earlier, the teacher. She said, for each of us, we're all called to do something in our lives, in our communities. And for me, this is, I feel, part of what I've been called to do. Even if it costs my health, I need to fight for these children. We have the people always tell us, you can transfer, go to another school. But who is going to fight for these children, for this community? Who's going to fight for my family? So leaving is not an option, okay? So you see here what she's saying is that a good citizen, a good person, right, defends and protects their community, their, uh, the other children in the community, right? Um, and she's also kind of talking about how that's reciprocal because who's gonna defend me? Who's gonna protect me, right? There's that mutuality um, that goes on there, okay? Um, and, you know, she's essentially saying, it's not an option, I refuse to leave, okay? Sometimes the responses were more terse, but they were just as profound, right? So Tanya of Long Beach Alliance, she said, when I asked her the same question, what do you say to officials when they say just move somewhere cleaner? And she said, but I'd be leaving them all alone. And she's like huffing and shaking her head, right? Like that's not even a question, right? So one of the um, ways in which we see this affecting politics and kind of new forms of politics among immigrants is that they become much more invested in the small p politics, the grassroots politics, okay? And largely because of the embodied and emotional support that that kind of politics offers, that voting and running for office and, and all that, even, you know, papers and the focus on that just doesn't provide, okay? So this is what I asked Lily, whom we met earlier, she's the undocumented Filipina youth, and I said, if you become a citizen, if you get the chance to become a U.S. citizen, will you be interested in voting? And she replied, sort of, and she paused. I mean, I really don't keep up, and she's kind of embarrassed as she laughs. And I said, why is that? Because it's not like those big politicians come over to our neighborhood, have coffee with us, ask us how we're doing, what our problems are. They don't do our people politics. They've only let us in this country until they don't need us anymore. Then they're like ready to kick us out. It's like someone you put all your effort into being friends with, and then when they don't need you anymore, they just drop you. I loved her. This millennial Gen Z reference was amazing. I loved it. It kept me excited about my research. So what she's essentially saying is that those big politicians, just like the friends who drop you when they don't need you anymore, don't do any emotional labor, right? They don't ask you how you are. They don't sit down and have coffee with you and try to listen to your problems and help you solve them, right? It's because of the emotional labor, the other people looking out for your health and your well-being, your body, you know, broadly, is the reason why she just wasn't as interested in the formal electoral realm. Now, does this mean that these youth or these immigrants are not gonna vote when it's important or something's on the line? Absolutely not, they will. But we've got to take seriously what, how they define politics and what they see as the most important kind of way of doing politics, right? Which is, as she said, people politics, being there for each other emotionally. So what I wanted to just talk about here is in sort of the um, implications of what I'm saying more broadly in my conclusion, which is that one thing we have to understand is that all the different ways in which the dominant institutions, be they regulatory, be they oil refineries, etc., the way that they kind of perceive and treat the um, largely Filipina women or the largely Mexican immigrant women really draws on historical um, controlling images of their group and of the nations from whence they came, okay? So this is where the global component comes in, which is like, it's, it's very common to see women of color as a very effeminate, um, focus on their reproduction, their moms, you know, either they have too many kids or we don't like the kids they bring in here. For the Asian American women, they might be seen as passive or meek because they're tied up with the whole model minority mythology, right? For Latinas who are working class, they are often dismissive because the idea is like the poor are quiet, we don't really have to listen to them, they're not important, right? They're not educated, they don't know what they're talking about, right? Just move, right? Um, and then you have these historical 
um, and continue on today controlling images of Asian American women. This was also brought out in the COVID-19 racism of the dragon lady, of the hyper-masculine, fiery, threatening, um, you know, persona, right? Um, which sometimes was uh, the way in which the women actually, you know, spoke back or fought back or yelled back, right? And um, that was at play. Also in terms of the way in which Latina women are also seen as hyper-masculine because they're fiery, they're angry, the working class is brash and they have no manners or they're not civilized, right? And the important thing about this is we have to understand that the way that racism and intersectionality work is to see uh, women of color, people of color, as particularly in their bodies and particularly in their emotions. They're not in their heads. They're not rational. They're not civil, right? They're not more in the mental faculties, which is what we prize as a society, right? That's the province mostly of the dominant group, mostly, for example, white American men. And so this idea that, you know, um, this group is more mental, more rational, more civil, is also what buttresses, right, their ability to do nothing or to give them like little concessions in terms of, okay, we won't, you know, uh, maybe put it right next to your school, right, things like that. But at the same time, I want to say while the environmental justice helps us understand how intersectional isms are maintained and expanded, it's important to say that these activists themselves are also really pushing back, okay? Um, not only do they in myriad ways defy some of these controlling images and show how mental they are, right? But they also demand empathy, they demand respect, and they do do a lot of work in exposing the problematic nature of corporate America and the regulatory agencies that are supposed to regulate them, right? So I believe that these emotional dynamics, emotive dynamics, really need to be studied to understand the fullness of this political process. Can you talk about the term bio-neglect? That was something that I saw in your writings that I didn't know that word. I, I, can, I can figure it out, I think, but I thought it would be good to have a term defined. Yes, um, okay, Woo. all right. Um, it is somewhat of a complicated concept. People talk about statewide policies uh, relating to the body and health and populations. The first scholar or theorist people often think of is Michelle Foucault, okay? And one of the things I wanted to do is to kind of make Foucault center intersectionality and women of color and immigration. Um, and some of this is not fair. Foucault died in the early 80s. He, he wasn't able to live to see exactly what was gonna happen you know, um, 40 years later. But um, I do think that we can hold him to account for not centering the way in which racism and the intersection of racism and patriarchy and class injustice slash capitalism, uh, you know, immigration injustice, right, um, is central to the way that governments and states decide to basically allow a number of deaths, right? Or allow a certain amount of sickness and how it's targeted against uh, these populations of color. In this case, I study women of color, right? Immigrant women of color. Um, and so what I wanted to do was kind of reformulate his concept, which he often um, terms biopower, right? Some of you might be familiar with that, um, biopolitics. And I wanted to center bio-neglect because, and, and no term is perfect, language is imperfect as all, always, right? <laughs> because really what I was saying is that it was both bio-violence and bio-neglect, right? But the violence is inherent in what Foucault already set up. So what I wanted to do was really focus on that race and intersections of race with all these other systems of oppression are determining who we decide to neglect, who we decide to let die, who we decide not to give health care to, who we decide to ostracize, exclude, cage, you know, um, and basically persecute their reproductive choices, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to capture that. Cool. Yeah, that is <laughs> um, so, in, so in the book, you talk so eloquently about race and class. 
Uh, but you also throw morality in there, and that's not something I think that we usually um, we usually put together. So could you talk about that concept of morality? Yeah, so great question. It extends from what I started talking about earlier about how citizenship wasn't just about um, let's get our papers, you know, um, let's uh, vote, let's you know take over uh, the political system. It, it was definitely not just about that, or not even centrally about that, even though they're really forced to assimilate like that, right? But it was really more about um, why are we doing this, right? Our lives are already really hard. We're already overtaxed, you know, um, especially with the low income and the unauthorized, right? Uh, there's so many things to worry about on a daily basis, just, you know, making enough income, right, to pay the rent and get food on the table and drive. But what they decided to focus on is, you know, we do all this and we're gonna keep doing this even if we have not a single victory during our entire lifetimes, right? Even if um, you know we die prematurely, um, and our kids do as well, um, even if no one knows about our campaigns and no one helps out, we're going to do this anyway because it is the moral thing to do, right? And because what is the purpose of living? Kind of like what Cindy, the Southern American teacher for Carson, is saying is because I'm called to do it. It might not make any sense. I might not see any results, but that's not why I do things. So. The journey was just as important to them than the, as the destination, and sometimes I thought maybe even more important than the destination, is that giving up, doing nothing, right, was the absolute worst possible scenario, right? That That's not an option, as Cindy would say, right? And so one of the ways in which they actually draw a dividing line between the officials and us is a lack of morality and the centering of morality, right? Mm -hmm. So that's partly what they're emotionally strategizing to expose, which is their lack of morality. Right. And, and on that topic, so there is obviously a need for empathy mm -hmm. from these politicians, from these corporate leaders, mm -hmm. that obviously is not happening because mm -hmm. of guilting and all these other things. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like there's a real open need for sociologists or social workers or somebody to train. Is there any opportunity for training these people in empathy? Or is it just a money issue, a power issue that will never change? Yeah, that's a that's the million dollar question. <laughs> I mean I I think what the women show us and what the movement shows, and my time in the field, like up to three years, showed me is that the system has to change. You know, we can say all we want, let's make individuals more empathic, right? Let's focus on training individuals like these officials to be more empathic, but it's, you know, what I love about these activists and working with them is they show me that it's not necessarily that they're focused on the individual immorality of the corporate and the, the government, it's the systemic immorality, right? It is the institutionalized immorality, which we see in environmental racism, environmental classism, right? If there was that morality, those factors, the environmental racism and classism would exist, right? right? So, you know, yes, we have to work um, from the ground up, but we also have to think about how do we, how do we strategize more institutionally? Yeah. Um, so men are generally the leaders of community organizations. Um, yet we have heard so much about women in Mexico, women in Iran, yep. Yep. Um, really taking on that role. Um, how do they differ from the men? Yeah, no, that's a great question. One of the first ways that they differ from the men is in the beginning, the men definitely don't prioritize doing emotional testimonies, right? <laughs> Talking about my family and how this bothers me or hurts me or makes me enraged, right? You know, they, they tend to focus more on the, the technical details. What are you doing with the study? Where's the health impact assessment? Why did you not come up with a different alternative? It's the women who really decide, look, our political strategy is focusing on how this is affecting our bodies, our emotions, our communities, how, you know, we're stressed out all the time, how we can't sleep because of light pollution, because of the construction noise, the oil refinery noise, you know, like all this sensory stuff that men don't necessarily prioritize. 
But what was fascinating is that even though a lot of times the men, because of historical legacy, etc., they they were the leaders or the founders of some of these organizations, when they saw that even if it wasn't compelling the officials, how much it compelled fellow residents mm -hmm. or got residents who were totally apathetic to actually become activists and get involved and join the fight, that that's when the men started to frown. Yeah. Like, oh, okay, maybe this is a good strategy. And, and they are kind of exposing them as cold-hearted snakes. <laughs> Not all of them are, obviously, but this is systemic, right? And essentially, the men started adopting that strategy, teaching immigrant residents how to do personal testimony. What are you going to say? How are you going to deliver it? All the politics of emotion that we were talking about. The women were role models. They basically. were, very much so, yeah. yeah. Um, so also something that I read in your book was that you said that the US collects little data mm -hmm. on asthma, mm -hmm. and that this is a very big problem. And so, first of all, why is that in this day and age of data collections? And also, how did this impact your research then? Thanks. Yeah, um, you know, one of the, I mentioned neoliberalism earlier, but one of the um, major dimensions of neoliberalism is to gut the social welfare state, okay? It's to gut, you know, the social safety net, okay? So the social security, Medicare, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and what that means is that there's a hyper-prioritization of what Wall Street wants to do, or what corporate America wants to do, okay? And very little regulation. So one of the staples of neoliberalism is, yes, there's regulation on the books, but in real life, in actuality, there's very little regulation. And that's why these communities I studied were so sick and getting cancer, and kids were getting asthma at two years old, for example, it's very frequent. And so that is one of the reasons we don't collect data on asthma, because we really no longer prioritize the public good, okay? And we've really focused on, uh, you're on your own, okay? You either sink or swim, okay? We're an individualist society. However your life fares is basically what you do as an individual. Um, it started in earnest in the 1980s with the Reagan administration, you know, and it's been this, you know, gradual, uh, gutting of uh, social programs, focus on the public good. I don't know if any of you guys have read the book Bowling Alone. We don't really do things collectively anymore. You know, we don't think about the collective good as a major priority organizing society. And the other reason, too, is that it mostly afflicts communities of color. It afflicts African American and black communities in disproportionate numbers, and it afflicts these immigrants of color that I spoke about, right? And that's just not a major priority of government at most levels, especially yeah. federal. Yeah. yeah, that is the bottom line. Yeah. Um, so just to change a little bit here, um, so, so how did you come to focus on environmental justice? And basically, in terms of research, what is your origin story? What is your testimony? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so I'll try to keep this brief. Um, so I've been doing organizing uh, mostly since college. So some of you may be organizers, may be starting your um, activist life. And um, I mostly organized around um, uh, you know, Prop 187, which was to basically criminalize immigrants who were deemed illegal, um, deny them basic access to social services that were being gutted, right? Education, healthcare, things like that. And then Proposition 209, which wanted to gut all um, affirmative action policies in housing, education, hiring, and contracting. Okay, so those are the major campaigns I worked on. But during that time, um, I, there was a campaign that one of my professors, Diane Pugino at UC Santa Barbara, um, whose work I encourage you to read, was for the Hopi Medina in Arizona. And it was about how they were getting really sick because their land was contaminated with uranium. And I had learned very little about this in my classes, had heard very, very little in the news media, um, you know, as much as I could follow it. And so when I learned about the fact that they were getting sick and getting cancer and organizing and protesting around all this uranium contamination on their lands, and I was wondering, like, why are their lands contaminated with uranium, right? And we find out because they mined, you know, uh, Native American land or, um, indigenous land for uranium and didn't care that they left it all open and didn't take care of it properly, right? And it caused a lot of cancer and death. 
Um, and so, but I, my involvement with 187, 209 um, just took over and I, I sort of just had to just leave it and I sort of barely got involved with it. But then as the climate mm -hmm. is changing and Al Gore's, you know, inconvenient truth and I'm learning about all the uh, local environmental injustices that urban communities of color, inner cities, et cetera, suffer, right? And then in the global south, how much they're suffering. It all kind of postulated mm -hmm. and I, I, you know, I realize I really want to work on this. And, and sometimes people say, oh, that's such a departure from your previous book. And, Yes and no, right? Because yeah. I'm still studying race and citizenship and transnationality and intersectionality. It's just in a very different domain. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Um, okay, I do want to leave time for uh, questions, but um, in chapter six, you briefly mentioned how digital technologies, like mm -hmm. i.e. social media, etc., mm -hmm. uh, help support and bring together movements and activists, uh, but it seems that the local connections the neighborhood are even stronger. Yeah. So can you talk more about the interplay? Sure. Well, there's a digital divide, right? So we can't, we can't presume that the immigrant activists even had you know, the ability to access the web, right? And so um, when you don't have access to computers or access to you know, um, constant uh, Wi-Fi, broadband, et cetera, um, when you speak to someone in the laundromat, when you speak to someone at the aerobics class, when you speak to someone at church, when you speak to someone at a makeup class or whatever it is, right? Those connections are very, very important. So one of the things that we have to remember is that some of our most celebrated and famous social movements, like the civil rights movement, right? That's the one that the world knows the most and has put the United States on the map in terms of social justice, is that that all came about through people coming together at church and talking, right? And figuring out what are we going to do to combat white supremacy, you know? How are we going to deal with, you know, the, the murders and the threats of murder and the lynching and, you know, a lot of it was just people politics, you know, in your local institutions coming together, you know, commiserating, planning, organizing, right? And it led to the most famous and probably one of the most consequential social movements we've ever had, right? Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, I just want to thank you for your brilliant pioneering work. Thank I mean, you. It's been so inspiring to hear your remarks about this amazing work. Um, and, and in your remarks, you mentioned several societal institutions both being complicit and pushing against sort of, sort of injustices documented in your work. Uh, and as an immigration and higher education scholar, mm -hmm. you know, that is an institution that I study. And, and, and in my work in particular, I have found a, a, a very interesting correlation between, you know, undocumented youth activists who have had several, you know, what medical anthropology refers to as ACEs, you know, adverse childhood events, mm -hmm. a correlation between that and advocacy as undocumented youth around these kinds of, you know, sort of, you know, uh, environmental justice issues. Yeah. Um, and so, but in your remarks, I, I haven't heard much about, you know, access to higher education, creating a pipeline of empowered leaders that, I mean, all the, you know, inspiring leaders that I've heard you talk about, uh, it, it doesn't, at least, the pieces that I've heard that you that you highlighted don't seem to have come out of a, a college experience or a higher education access empowerment uh, civic engagement mm -hmm. awakening uh, and so I'm wondering if you could speak to uh, as an institution of higher education mm -hmm. as the system of higher education across the country. Um, you know, and these intersectional sort of, you know, kind of movements, uh, what is your perception after having done this work about the role of higher education, uh, you know, you know, sort of working alongside these inspiring folks in your local Yeah, community? I didn't focus on higher education because the vast majority of the activists are actually in high school. And, and that's a testament to how the environmental justice movement uh, like Communities for a Better Environment, CBE, who I highlighted, they have a long-standing program of intervening in high school. 
Um, and a lot of um, you know people who come from low income, undocumented communities, there's no guarantee that they're going to go to college, right? Or they'll be able to afford college, etc. And and the undocumented status adds a whole other layer. So um, the Activists who did have a college education did end up being oftentimes the leaders, right? Either the coordinators, like Ben of People's Corps, Lily, who I cited, who was on Documented Filipina, she actually had started with CBE as a high schooler, but was continuing on as she went to community college. So sometimes there's that translation across um, institutions. But I think the environmental justice movement, the one that's fighting environmental racism and classism, um, and fighting, for example, for clean air um, and cleaner schools, etc. They're really intervening in the earlier years. And why that's so important is because why are so many high schools in Wilmington, in West Long Beach, in Carson silent about this? Right? Because who's giving them funds? The oil refineries, right? They get money from the port of LA and Long Beach, they get money from uh, you know all these entities that basically are buying their silence, right? And so, interestingly enough, organizations like CBE, People's Court, etc., are going into high schools, and they find themselves kicked out, right? Because the principal and the teachers get all skittish and afraid we're going to lose all their funding if you start organizing against the hyper pollution from you know the oil refineries, Valero, Marathon, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right from the ports, right? And because of that, in some ways, they've actually instigated the students to want to get involved, right? There's nothing better than telling young people you can't do this, right? <laughs> and so that is what CBE, People's Corps, and Chris and LaBarca, et cetera, tried to harness, right? And that's why increasingly, the strongest activist movements, like the ones you're talking about, right? DACA, the UndocuQueers, you know, they're youth, they're young people starting in high school, right? And so this is where, when everything seems like the world is going to hell in a handbasket, you know, that we're heartened by the organizing and the fervent, right, movements waged by youth, right? Um, and we're seeing it with climate justice too, right? It's not just Greta Thunberg, but you have indigenous youth from all kinds of global southern countries that are at the forefront, right? Taking the lead on you stole our childhoods, right? What's going to happen? Okay. So that's a great question. Um, you know, I think given that I was more focused on the activists as they are right now, I, I think we actually need to be studying high school more. Uh, hi, Nadia. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, <laughs> thanks so much for this talk. It was really um, very interesting, and I, I congratulations on the book. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, your discussion of emotion mm -hmm. um, and how emotions are getting deployed mm -hmm. um, in these questions and in these movements, both as strategy but mm -hmm. also as a way to shape sort of the opponent and define yes. the opponent. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to push you in a slightly different direction of thinking about emotion, and if it's something that isn't a part of the book, just say that. And I'll call it. <laughs> but, um, but to think about it maybe in a somewhat different way, and of course I'm approaching these questions as a historian, mm -hmm. and I think probably the humanities have done a little bit more with the emotions. Right, the definitely, yes. I'm talking about social scientists, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So two kinds of maybe different ways of thinking about these questions, and I'm wondering, you know, what how you, what, how you encounter these things. Mm -hmm. um, one is the ways in which emotion wasn't, it's not just a strategy to be deployed, but actually shapes how people are viewing and coming to these issues. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about all the work that's being done on issues around climate despair, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the second part of that is a methodological question. Um, because you're working in with interviews, or what I would call oral histories and narrators, is how methodologically you're theorizing emotion in terms of their own reporting, right? And how you trouble um, what they're saying with the emotions that they're bringing uh, to what they're saying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate that very much. Um, so let me start with the second question. I might need you to remind me a little bit about the first question, sorry. Um, a little tired, <laughs> being honest. But for the latter question, uh, I actually didn't expect them to talk so much about emotions. And 
when you know, I thought it was going to be about the mechanics of the movement and what what they've experienced, and kind of like a you know recording of losses, wins, and you know struggles. And I mean, I knew it would be a part of it, but I didn't know it would be central. And I think because of that, methodologically, you know, using the grounded theory approach I mentioned, which is basically that you allow the the sort of people and the situations to speak for themselves, and then you theorize from there, right? Or there's something called the extended case study. You take a case study and you try to link it to broader structural institutional patterns. And so I'm kind of doing a little bit of both. But um, oftentimes I was listening both to their language but also to their body language, right? To their affect. And so when they would talk about feeling despair, like you're saying climate despair or depressed, I'm listening to the language because they're using that language, like actually using, I'm depressed, I'm suffering from depression, I am exhausted, I feel demoralized, right? Um, I am enraged. Um, I was listening to the language at the same time as an ethnographer, because I wasn't just doing interviews, I was doing ethnography, so I was participant of observing during that time period. Um, you know, I just recording their body language because I realized how important that was to also understanding how the corporate and the government officials were also um, sort of circulating emotion, right, and deploying strategies through that. And so a lot of times, you know, it's like, oh, or the, oh my God, you know, or, you know, it, like all this body language, right, like walking out, right, like, psh, you know, and um, shaking of the heads and, you know, and then sort of watching the women either in the interview setting their shoulders being slumped, or their eyes getting downcast, or their voices breaking, or, um, you know, in the comments, uh, the public comments, or the protests, you know, like a spitting, the red rings, you know, all that stuff. And so, in that sense, what I was arguing is that these are important things to pay attention to, because, you know, I, I, I think the humanities have been a lot better, and, and for example, the work of Sarah Ahmed, I think, is amazing and, you know, um, really talks about the way in which there's a, an economy of emotions, right? It circulates um, and it affects all the people that are um, involved. And, you know, I, I think we need to be paying more attention to these kinds of emotive, affective, bodily cues, which, you know, I'm a social scientist. You know, I've been trained forever as a social scientist. Nobody ever prioritized. Nobody really centered. And therefore, it doesn't become part of the analytical framework, right? If you center and value it, then it becomes something that we use to analyze or something that we approach the field with, something that we build concepts and theories from, right? It wasn't like that at all. And so now there's kind of this movement, and I think it links to your point about climate despair, like intuitive social science intuitive science, right? That it's not just about what do you see, right? It's only what you see that's true, right? But to intuit through body language, you know, what's not said, right? What might be felt. Um, and I do think speaking about feminist and intersectional methodology, had I been a man or a man of color, I don't necessarily think they would have shared as much or focused so much on the emotional toll and the depressed, I, I don't know if they would have talked as much about that, just like I don't think they would have brought up as much, you know, issues about children and family, which obviously were central, not just to their lives, but to their politics. So I think thinking about who the researcher is, the way they approach, you know, all that has to be a part of our understanding. Um, and I hope we do move towards a more intuitive social science. So um, I, I want to say that we are getting close to ending our program. Um, I know we have a lot of students here. Uh, a lot of them are here because their professors have yeah. asked them to be here, and I want to make sure that they get a chance to ask questions. So do we have a student who maybe has a question? Any students? There's someone Wait. back there. Oh, oh, I thought she was right. That's okay. I need the steps. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my question is on, um, so I come from an immigrant background as well, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you found patterns of um, 
these women, these immigrant women activists talking about religion or invoking mm -hmm. spirituality when talking about environmental activism? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that's a great question, thank you. Yeah, so uh, when I was mentioning Cindy, the Pacific Islander teacher earlier, when she was talking about in life we all have a calling, elsewhere in my book, a lot of it is from her own spiritual beliefs as a Christian. Um, she you know, invoked a lot of Bible stories to affirm why she was an activist, why she would never move, uh, no matter how sick she got or her children and family got. And so to me, she was, you know, melding kind of a belief in grassroots politics with her spiritual ideology, right? And, um, you know, the workings of her church. She talked a lot about the church, volunteering, going out and doing work for um, those who are less fortunate. Um, and so I do think that religion played a big part. Now, for both the Filipinx and the largely Mexican Latinx activists, Catholicism is the main belief system, right? Um, and although, and I would ask, I would press, you know, I would, I would ask, like, how does your faith or your religious practice or Catholicism, you know, play a role in your activism? It, there never was like a clear connection. But the way that the connection became clear is that they usually could rely on the resources of the Catholic Church to do their activism, right? So all the things that are not sexy about activism, like where are we going to meet, right? Where are we going to have the event? Where are we going to cook for the meeting or the event? Where, who's going to do the childcare, right? A lot of times it was in the Catholic Church. And the church would allow them to use their buildings, their resources, their poster board, whatever it was. And that's where uh, the Catholic Church became quite central. Now, interestingly enough, I do have a chapter in my book, which I'll say very briefly. Because of, uh, especially among the Latina activists, the strong Catholic faith, there were political contradictions that I didn't expect, right? So when I think about environmental justice activists fighting racism and all that stuff, I assume, okay, they're progressive on all fronts, right? But because of Catholicism, there was quite a bit of conservatism with regard to gay marriage, with regard to a choice, and all of that. That just took me by surprise because I made assumptions, right? Um, and so that was one way it played out in a way I never expected. Thank you. Okay, um, I have one more of the red. Yeah. Oh, Leon, hi. Nadia, hi, thank you so hi. much for this, and congratulations on the book. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, obviously, um, we have witnessed industrialization and that system mm -hmm. replicated in different countries globally as globalization. Um, and so I'm curious in your research if you came across similar activism in different countries, mm -hmm. um, around these communities of immigrants in different countries, mm -hmm. um, because that's also part of the treacherous trickle-down economics. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so I, I'm curious of what you, I mean, especially also considering your first book, sort of, I'm kind of linking the two of them together a little bit. Yeah, no thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, yeah, so, as Regards immigrant activists in other countries or the global south, for example, a lot of times uh, we don't understand that environmental justice is also having a clean workplace, right? Mm -hmm. Non-toxic, non-hazardous to your body, your emotions, etc. And so many migrant uh, workers across the world actually suffer environmental injustice at work, right? Whether it's putting our chips together or building in our factories, right? So a lot of the movements that immigrant activists in other countries are engaging in have to do with fighting uh, environmental injustice through labor. But as far as um, what I'm aware of in terms of you know major environmental justice movements, some of the activists that I worked with, for example, the Filipina um, activists from Carson, they're also fighting on transnational fronts, okay? So they're engaged in movements that are against the U.S. military-based pollution in the Philippines, for example, I don't know if some of you heard in Subic Bay, they, the U.S. military just literally dumped all their chemicals and toxins into their waterway that they drink from, right? So they're engaged in these movements uh, connecting Filipinx and Filipinx-American 
um, environmental justice organizations. So over there, they're fighting imperial environmental racism, right? Here, they're fighting domestic environmental racism. And so but there are other movements, too, where, for example, in the Philippines, uh, logging companies have been given free reign uh, to the archipelago, right? And so they just log and, and just decimate forests, right? But what ended up happening is that because the local communities had no protection, because now the forests were all gone, there were all these drowning deaths when there were flash floods, right? And so that's an environmental justice issue. That's also an imperialist environmental justice issue because that's global capitalism right there, right? We have global capitalism allowed in by colonialism. So they're fighting on those fronts and making connections and learning from each other, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, in other countries, I mean, you guys have probably heard about it in the news, right? Um, the indigenous people fighting the decimation of the Amazon forest that, that we need to breathe, what they call the lungs of the earth. You know, um, women, indigenous women fighting the contamination of their lands, um, corporations that are invading and overtaking and poisoning and killing people. You know, honestly, I think if, if we could make more connections between all of these different environmental justice fights, that would be incredible, but as an activist, I also know that's incredibly hard. That's a tall order. Right? 